Nice. All right, what's the declension of Hehora? First declension, feminine, pure or alpha, rho or vowel, hora, horas, hora, horan, hora. Horai, horon, horais, horas, horai. What's the declension of hey phone? First declension, feminine, pure eta. Phone, phonase, phone, phonane, phone. Phonai, phonone, phonice, phonus, phonai. What's the declension of hey doxa? First declension, feminine, mixed. Doxa, doxes, doxe, doxon, doxa. Doxi, doxon, doxis, doxus, doxi. What's the declension of ha prophetes? First declension masculine, prophetes, prophetu, prophete, prophetain, propheta. Prophetai, prophetone, prophetis, prophetas, prophetai. What's the declension of ha lagas? Second declension masculine, lagas, lagu, lago, logon, loge. Lagoi, Lagon, Lagois, Lagus, Lagoi. What's the declension of ta ergon? Second declension neuter. Ergon, ergu, ergo, ergon, ergon. Erga, ergon, ergois, erga, erga. What's the declension? Pardon me. Of ha archon, archon test. Third declension, masculine, feminine. Archon, archontas, archonti, archonta, archon. Archontes, archonton, arcusi, archontas, archontes. What's the declension of tasoma, somatas? Third declension neuter, soma, somatas, somati, soma, soma. Somata, somatone, somasi, somata, somata. What's the declension of ha he ta? Ha tu to tan hoi tone tois tus. He tes te tain hi tone tice tus. Ta tu to ta ta tone tus ta. Sorry, tus. Tois. What's the declension of ego su? First and second person pronouns. Ego, emu, amoy, ame. He mace, he moan, he mean, he must. Su, su, soy, se. Who mace, who moan, who mean, who must. What are the principal parts of luo? Luo, luso, elusa, leluka, lelumai, eluthane. What's the conjugation of luo in the present active indicative? Luo, lues, lue, luomen, luete, luusi. Infinitive, luane. What's the conjugation of luo in the present middle passive indicative? Luomai, lue, luetai, luamatha, luestha, luontai. Infinitive, luesthai. What's the conjugation of ami in the present indicative? Ami, a, esti, n, a, e. What's the conjugation of Lua in the imperfect active indicative? Eloan, Eloes, Eloe, Eluamen, Eluete, Eloan. Let me pause real quick. That's our new memory work for this chapter, right there. The Luo in the imperfect active indicative. I think just this Sunday in our sermon, I saw that third person singular form, Eloe, with that movable new on it. I think twice, if I recall. Um, so it was one of those, again, those little news, right, in parentheses, they may be there, they may not be there. So, just happened to see a couple of them this weekend. What's the conjugation of luo in the imperfect middle passive indicative? Eluamain, elu, eluita, eluamatha, eluista, eluanta. What's the conjugation of ami in the imperfect indicative? Amain, ace, ain, amen, ate, a son. What's the conjugation of Lua in the future active indicative? Luso, Luces, Luce, Lusamen, Lusate, Lususi. Infinitive, Lusane. 
What's the conjugation of luo in the future middle indicative? Lusamai, luce, lucitai, lusamatha, lusistha, lusantai. In our infinitive, lusistai. What's the conjugation of ami in the future indicative? Esamai, essay, estai, esamatha, esistha, esantai. What's the conjugation of luo in the first aorist active indicative? Elusa, elusas, elusa, elusamen, elusate, elusun. Infinitive, lusai. Um, last page. What's the conjugation of luo in the first aorist middle indicative? Elusamen, eluso, elusata, elusamatha, elusistha, elusamta. Infinitive, lusistai. What's the conjugation of lumbano in the second aorist active indicative? Elabon, elabes, elabe, elabamen, elabete, elabon. Infinitive, labane. What's the conjugation of lumbano in the second aorist middle indicative? Elabamane, elabu, elabata, elabamatha, elabestha, elabanta. Infinitive, labesthai. What's the conjugation of luo in the perfect active indicative, the most fun? Leluka, lelukas, leluke, lelukamen, lelukate, lelukasi. Infinitive, lelukenine. What's the conjugation of luo in the perfect middle passive indicative? Lelumai, lelusai, lelutai, lelumatha, lelustha, leluntai. Infinitive, lelusthai. What's the conjugation of luo in the pluperfect Active indicative. Elelukane, elelukes, eleluke, elelukemen, eleluketa, elelukesun. What's the conjugation of lua in the aorist passive indicative? Eleuthane, eleuthes, eleuthe, eleuthemen, eleutheta, eleuthesun. Infinitive, luthenai. What's the conjugation of lua in the future passive indicative? Luthesamai, luthese, luthesatai. Luthesamatha, Luthesistha, Luthesuntai. And then our prayer, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And in Greek, Yesu, Huye, David, Eleisonme, Hamartalan. Notice that may, y'all can take a seat. That may is an enclitic may. It's given its accent over to Eleisonme. So we've got a double accent on Eleison. All right. Let's go over our homework and um, really uh, we're going to kind of just build on some of the ideas we talked about last week. Um, if we went kind of all the way back to the question of um, how do we parse a verb. So take good old, our good old buddy, oh, let's see, I won't make you do luo. Let's do luo men. Um, how would we parse that? Do you remember what, what does parse mean? There you go, to take it apart, to, to label its parts, or to you know, identify and kind of break it down. So with a verb, um, there are seven parts um, of the verb. Let's see, I just want another color. There we go. Um, that we could say about this verb, even though it only has six letters, we could actually say seven things about it. Do you remember any of them? Okay, so the stem is going to be one thing. What's the stem? Good. In this instance, it's Lou, right? It, so it's the... The piece that the ending gets added onto. Um, and so what does the stem tell us? For us so far in Greek, in, in about um, four chapters, we'll learn it tells us something else. But for now, it just tells us what? Okay, great. Yeah, so, so we actually call that the root word. So like, you know, simply put, like, if I was to look it up in a dictionary, what would I look it up under? So... Lou tells me that the root word is good. And, and what's the actual word that I would find in the Greek dictionary or the Greek glossary? Luo. Good. So, and you actually hit on both of those together right there. So we, we, the root and the translation of that root. Um, one slight point that I'll make. Translation is a, is a tricky word. So technically, like I loosen or I destroy is really more what's called a gloss. It's just kind of a simple you know, word or something like that. Luo is actually, because remember, a verb is a word symbol that communicates an action or a state of being. So Luo, you have laces on your shoes. 
you would luo them, right? You untie them. Um, so then we could kind of make sense of how that, when applied to a person, so to speak, you would um, destroy them, right? Does that kind of make sense? Like you're, you're unmaking them, you're disintegrating them, so to speak. You're ripping them apart uh, when applied to a person. So anyway, I loose could be applied to a shoe. It could be applied to a knot on a boat. It could be applied to a fishing line. It could be applied to a person. When it's applied to a person, it's not so good. But anyway, so, so technically that's more of a gloss, which again, is totally fine. Um, we'll call it a translation. So luo would be like, I destroy. That's totally fine. All right. What else could we kind of piece? So there's two of them. Number six and seven. What else about that? Okay, good. And where do you see, first, I guess, what is person and number? And then where do you see that in this Greek verb? Okay, so you see it in the ending. And what, what is person and number? And so number is singular or plural? Yeah. And what does that mean? One or more than one. What? Things what? Things like okay, there you go. All right. So it means our subject, right, is singular and plural. And of course, I could be even meaner and say, and what's a subject? But anyway, we'll wait for that for just a second. All right. So the number would be either singular or plural. With amen, is that singular or plural? plural. Good. And, and you just ran that in your mind, right? So again, I want to just highlight, memory is essential to learn language, right? Whether it's an ending, where we're going, oh, I say, I'm going to, oh, there it was, I found it, right? Um, or it's the actual vocab piece, right? V v uh, vocab, endings, things like this are, are really, really important. Okay, so you said it was plural. And then what was, oops, as I write number again, um, what was a uh, person about? You said first, second, and third. What's that about? First person, second person, third person? Yeah, what does that mean? Good. Good, excellent. So if the subject is the actor, notice we're talking about for an active verb, we're gonna talk about that in a second. If the subject is the actor, it would be really awkward if the subject used a second or third person, right? Like. You are teaching Greek. No, 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 I'm teaching Greek. Or Mr. McCord is teaching Greek. That's weird, right? Like, that's, <laughs> don't talk about yourself in the third person, right? That's, that's odd. So if it's first person, right, the speaker is the actor. If it's second person, the speaker's talking to the actor. You are answering. And if it's a third person, right, the subject is speaking about not himself or herself, not someone who's present, but somebody else, right? The guy out there is mowing the grass or something like that. Okay. So these two categories relate to the subject's relationship to the verb. Does that kind of make sense? Is the subject singular or plural? One or more than one. Is the subject, the speaker is the actor, so the subject is both the speaker and the doer. Not or looking or talking to the speaker. The speaker is talking to the doer. Pardon me. And the speaker is talking about the doer. All right, and then what person is amen, did you say? Okay. okay. First, it is. Good. So right, O, A, S, A, and then back to the amen. Good. So this is first, which means like the, the speaker is the doer and the speaker is more than one. And we use the word we for that, right? Okay, there are three more things. Okay, it's active. That's called the voice of the verb. All right. What does active mean? Or rather, let's just zoom out for a second. What is the voice? Don't tell me it's a show. That's a bad dad joke, Lucas. Don't say that. Nobody likes bad dad jokes. Just ask my high schoolers. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so what's active about? Or voice about? Or voice about, I'll have to make you back. But active means like it's happening or the person is like acting to it. What person? Um, in this case, the subject. So it's not technically a person. Could it, could it be? It could be. So give me an example where the subject is a person doing something. Okay, give me an example where not a person is doing something. Lovely, good. So either way, it seems like either way, you defined active 
as the subject acts. Is that right? The subject does, right? Whatever that, you know, verb is. Something like that? What are the other voices? Passive. Passive. And there's one more. Middle. All right. So I'll do them just in this order. Active, passive, and middle. So these are our three voices, right? Okay. Passive. So in active, the subject acts. In passive, remember from last week? Good. The subject is acted upon. The subject, we could say, uh, does not act, but that's actually not even clear enough. Because that could, that definition, notice, could apply to what kind of verb? The subject doesn't act. Good! Excellent! A linking or a stative verb could also be true, like I am. Well, I'm not acting, so is that passive? No, that's not passive. So we're talking about action verbs, right? All of these are for action verbs, where someone is doing something, not state of being verbs. So that's, that's kind of a big category. So within this subcategory of action verbs, that's actually, that would be a fine definition. The subject does not act, but rather we would say is acted upon. And notice that just brings us back to we have an action verb. We have an action happening. So uh, uh, Jesus teaches, active. The disciples are taught, passive. Maybe we have an agent in there by Jesus, right? And, uh, hupa plus genitive for agent. All right, then we have middle. This one's rare. I don't think it came up even once on the homework, if I recall. I, okay, all right, then fair enough. I, I, I don't think it came up once. Middle, though, do you remember what that is? Good. So it's, uh, I don't know, the subject's the middle man. I'm not totally sure why they even call that that, to be honest with you. Um, but that's exactly right. The subject acts and is acted upon. Um, again, I, I just like, a, I like little diagrams, right? The subject is the doer of the verb and the receiver of the verb. Active, the subject does the verbal action. Passive, the subject receives the verbal action. Something like that, okay? Now again, all of those sentence patterns, we could expand infinitely. Does that make sense, right? So, so for example, in this, this top one, we could, have a simple, you know, the dog barks. We could explain that to be the dog, uh, the muddy brown dog who lives under my grandfather's house, barks at the neighbors down the street who won't keep tempting him with the bone, right? We could, ex believe it or not, we could expand that sentence infinitely, especially if we wrote like the Founding Fathers or Cicero or somebody like that. Like, trust me, they just keep stretching that sentence. Uh, this, the, how the Apostle Paul writes where we get so tired of his sentences, we just stick a period in the translation. We're like, okay, Paul, you gotta stop there at some point, man. Like, I'm just gonna give you a break. Same thing for the passive. We could have a simple passive. The disciples are taught. The faithful disciples who are gathered in uh, the, uh, Peter's mother's house are taught by Jesus while he, you, know, anyway, you expand, expand, and expand. So this is just the simple, basic core of the clause. The core of the clause is, and I just want to highlight this, it's about the verb and the subject's relationship to the verb. Does that make sense? That's the main thing I would say, like, as we're looking at a sentence, discerning what's our verb, what's its voice? What, do I have an express subject or do I, do I have an unexpressed subject? So that's voice. This is an active, which means we are the subject and we are doing the destruction in this case. All right, two more things. Mm -hmm. Good. And what's this? That's called the tense. And what tense is this? When is this happening? Present. Good. I don't want to highlight this because we're going we're gonna to come to this today. So in Greek, there are two really big ideas that are, are, are locked up in or are communicated with the tense of the verb. The first, what we usually think of, is the idea of when, or the time of the verb. So, for simplicity's sake, I, I love a, a nice timeline. 
So we'll just say in the middle of this is now. We'll say after this is later. We'll say before this was already. Okay. I was taught that a wise man or woman walks through life backwards, fixing your eyes on the past because you can't ever predict the future. But if you know the past and natures, like human natures, don't change, then you might have a decent idea of what might be just around the bend, so to speak. So the wise folks look backwards as they walk forwards because they walk forwards now cautiously. You can't really tell what's behind me ever. So facing the future can be really dangerous because you can't see it, but you can see the past maybe. I digress. Um, so present tense happens now, right? I'll put it up here in pink. But not if the pink marker doesn't work. Trash can. Oh, off the rim! Oh, that was probably really loud on the video. Okay, all right. So I'll just do it in black. Okay, so when does it happen? It happens now, right? And, and maybe even like proverbially now. Like, uh, you know, I, I walk my dog each day. That's not technically happening now, but you know, it's happening in the now-ish, so to speak. So that's time. That's usually what we think of. There's a second really important idea of tense that can maybe be lost on us, and that's called the aspect of the verb, or you could think of it of, as the how of the verb. Like, what kind of verbal action are you describing? Okay. So with the present tense, for example, there are two possible hows, or there are two possible aspects of the verb. So in Greek, and we've kind of see this, seen this, what are the two ways we could translate this present active indicative, first person plural verb, coming from luo meaning I destroy? We could translate that as, uh, we'll just say destroy for both of them. Okay, so that would be one, we destroy. What's the other? We are destroying. That's exactly right. We are destroying. Now I want to highlight something from both perspectives. From the Greek perspective, they have no problem with this one form potentially communicating either a simple aspect, we destroy, so I put a little dot up here, that's what that is or what's called a progressive aspect. We are blanking, we are destroying. This kind of ongoing thing that so sounds that way, right? Like we're right in the midst of it. Like we are learning Greek. I'm, I'm kind of in the midst of the story versus just like a, we learn Greek, okay? So from the Greek perspective, so to speak, both of those aspects could be present in this verb. From the English perspective, these communicate different things. Now, not radically different, but like there, there maybe are some different connotations there, depending on you know the context we use it in. Okay. So from our English eyes, and I'll just say like if you're teaching this to like younger kids, or this idea, the same same idea is true in uh, Latin, for example. They want to see this as like a linking verb construction. We are blank, right? Um, I am sitting. They want to see that three forms. Um, not so. Not so. Even though for us, this is this like uh, form of to be plus a present active participle. Um, not so. Not so in Greek. Okay? So this we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this, uh, these two big ideas. The last one, which you don't really have to worry about, is just mood. Um, the mood of the verb, we won't get into till we get to imperatives. And you know what an imperative is. What's an imperative? A command. Good. But so far, all of our verbs are in the indicative mood. Okay? And this is a really hard word to define. All it just means is <laughs> something like the speaker is just expressing reality. It's indicating reality. Versus a command, which communicates an order or a subjunctive, which communicates a potentiality, a wish, a desire, a, a, uh, a condition that perhaps could be something like that. So if, if subjunctive, and, and those are what are kind of on the opposite ends of the scale. Subjunctive is like, I don't know. Indicative is like, that's just what it is. Now it could be a lie, right? Or could be like, unicorns are light blue. 
Maybe they are. I don't know. Anyway, so it could just be a lot. You know, I have 17 children. That's still an indicative, okay? even if it's not true. Its mood is indicative, um, even though it's not true. So it's not like it's indicative means that the person's not wrong. <laughs> you know, 2 plus 2 is 17. That's still in the indicative, even though it's wrong. OK. It's incorrect. OK. Um, so last time, we added this passive middle. And before we kind of play with this a little more, any specific questions from the homework? Um, and I put a little note in the answer key. I think the main, again, the main first step is going to be, um, again, on the vocab, which I know you haven't had some time to get the vocab down. And that's totally OK, actually, for today. But anything that stood out to you from the answer keys, from however many you were able to get to, and again, I know it's been a whopping seven days. Oh yeah. I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake. A gero. Uh, it's a gero, right? Not a gerontai. Or a geromai. Yeah, it's just a mistake. Good. Yeah, so that's a, um, it's a real passive, right? It's a, um, an actual passive versus a deponent. Do you remember what a deponent is? Yeah, fake passive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. So that's just my eyes were wrong. They were like, um, oh, it's a, it's a deponent. No, it's not a deponent. It actually really is a passive. And that can be, that can be tricky, right? When you see it and you're like, wait, what was that? What was that dictionary form? So it's just wrong. There you go. That's what happens. So deponent, I'll just stick that definition down here. Deponent looks passive. Right? And the way that we're going to tell that is by knowing our dictionary form. So the dictionary form of that is a gero, not like a geromai or something like that. So the dictionary form, it's going to look passive, uh, but translate actively. So erkomai, for example, I come, not like uh, I am taken or, you know, some, something like that. So that's just going to come from the dictionary form. So ironically, as I illustrate the exact point, I was trying to prove. No, it's no, it's so hard. Probably the only trick. So, like, one of the early ones was about Doeg the Syrian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so that is where I would say it is totally legitimate to translate what you can translate, right? Like, for example, in that one. I see hasuras sure does look like it's a nominative, right? With that, that article ha on there. Um, I see apocrinitai. Uh, again, that's answers. So and the Syrian or hasuras, even if I, let's just say I was like the suras answers. Uh, uh, I have seen the sun. So that sentence in particular, you've got like three nouns and adjectives that are, that are names or people groups or something like that. So I would just look it up. I would just check yourself that way. So first kingdoms is first Samuel. So the way that they're numbered in the Septuagint are kingdoms one, two, three, and four. And we would call those either the book of Samuel. Some translations will actually just have a book of Samuel. But the standard is actually to say first Samuel, second Samuel, first Kings, second Kings. So in the Septuagint, those are called the kingdoms. Anyway. So yeah, I would look it up and not feel any shame about it. <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing like my students sometimes will be like, well, 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 uh, how, how would the, the, the Romans pronounce Augustine? It's like, um, Augustinus? Is that what you're going to say? No, we just say, you're, you're going to call Augustine or Augustine. Just pick your poison and roll with it, man. It doesn't matter. Like, let's not, let's not get, a uh, Moshe? Are you going to say Moshe every time you say, uh, like, no, just, just, just roll with it. It's totally fine. So, yeah. that's one of my, like, I appreciate a name accurately said, but pick your language. Anyway. Yeah. Well, especially this one. I mean, probably we, not many of us have Doeg the Syrian uh, in our Bible memory banks, right? Like, I certainly didn't. And I was like, Doeg? I don't remember him. And then if, if you actually, I, so I looked it up, and it was like D-O-E-G. 
it's fine. Also, I mean, one thing worth noting, so though that adjective Syrian declines, suras, um, the names don't, right? So that Jesse there, Yesai, is, is actually a genitive, the son of Jesse. I've seen the son of Jesse. Um, you wouldn't know that. Sometimes they'll stick a, pardon me, an article on there, but you wouldn't know that. It's just, it's tricky. It's tricky. It's some the same thing, like if you're reading it like in Hebrew or Aramaic or something, and all you know are the, you know, Englishized versions of names, you can like, quote unquote, read the name and you're like, I don't know who that is. Oh, that's, Yitzhak is Isaac, for example, like Yitzhak. I don't know. Maybe that sounds like, maybe that sounds the same. It, there are a whole lot of names <laughs> like you just don't recognize when you see them. So anyway. Yeah. It, well, it's funny, and you've got all kinds of like translation through language. So, like German is actually a really important translational language. So, Jehovah is a Germanization of Yahweh, kind of a really butchered Germanization. Anyway, there's a lot going on there. So it's like, well, golly, it's actually it almost kind of tells a story of like, oh man, Germany was an important translational language. Uh, you know, English was uh, Italian, not as much. Um, I'm trying to think, well, it's got major translation, but anyway. It's just funny, the story of how we got our names, right? Jesus rather than like Jesus. English would have no problem with Jesus, actually. Uh, of course, you can see how that becomes like Jesus, which is much closer, or Jesus is much closer in the Spanish. But um, anyway, we follow the German translational tra tradition usually. Anyway, whether we should or not, that's what we do. So much so that when you actually see Jesus, you're like, wait, well, who is that? And you're like, that's Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that happened to my high schoolers. They're like, who's Jesus? I'm like, oh, that's Jesus, guys. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, no, that's what it looks like. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Oh, another fun one. Um, since, since we're in South Carolina, uh, look at the New Testament, uh, number seven, whether you got there or not. One of my favorite peoples in the whole Bible right there. Uh, Ente Beroya. Beroya? West side of Greenville, right? West side, northwest side, Berea. Uh, the Bereans, of course, who were praised for looking earnestly into the scriptures. One of my favorite stories, right, where Paul comes and he delivers the word and he says, and the Bereans were no, more noble uh, for they, earnest, they listened to Paul and then earnestly searched out the scriptures to see if what he taught them was true. And they were more noble than the others who either accepted it or rejected it without searching into the scriptures. It's kind of a people group for me, I think. They're my folks. Okay. All right. All right, well, let's go into our new topic um, for the night. And again, um, yeah, that, that's a big idea. That's a big idea. So tonight we kind of get, in, in one sense, like a smaller idea. I hope it feels smaller. We're adding a new tense. Um, and there's really only one um, big idea that we're going to add to to what's already up on the board. So we're going to add the tense of the imperfect, the imperfect tense. And where my eraser go? Oh, there. Um, so let me. We're going to add the imperfect tense. So I'll keep my timeline. Let's see. I'll just change this. Um, if you would, would you go to? Um, your recitation, and pick for me one of the forms, your choice, one of the forms of the imperfect active indicative from the recitation. Imperfect active indicative, sorry. Find it and see. Um, totally your choice. Aluita, okay, that's great. All right. Uh, All right. So as we look at that, that uh, just that form, and again, I'll, I'll say this, it, it's in the imperfect, but I just want to see what do you notice? And again, you can look at this form if you like, or you can look at the whole recitation there. Right, so in the present active indicative, we have luo, luois, lue, luomen, luete, lucy. In the imperfect, we have Eloan, Eloes, Eloe, might have a new there, a movable new. Um, Eloes, Eloe, Eloe, 
Eluan, Elues, Elua, Eluaman, Eluata, Eluan, right? So what do you notice about those forms? What's, what's different? What, what's changed? What's the morphology? The fancy pants word for that is morphology. Great. So there's something, and, and um, in English grammar, what do we call that when we kind of stick something onto the front? Okay, good. And that's totally fine. We don't call it that in Greek. But that's totally fine. Like, you've got a prefix on there. There's something stuck on the beginning, like prefixed, right? F fixed onto the beginning of it. Okay? So that wasn't there. Uh, uh, what else do you see? Anything jump out to you, Alicia? Don't be afraid to be simple. It's the number one mistake adults make. They want to be profound. Um, well, kind of like the middle passage, it's going to be vowel. It's going to be over the E. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Or okay. That, the um, that is a part of the ending. Um, but that's actually a good observation. So, so what do you notice about the ending? Oh, or endings? Eloan, Elos, Eloa, Eluaman, Eluata, Eloan. Are those the same endings or are those different endings? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. To the present, I can What do you mean? Okay, so you've got like ace becomes s. Yes. Cool, yeah. How about in the third person singular? Again, yeah, good. So a became a or n. Uh huh. How about your pl first person plural? So So that one seems pretty far apart. Yeah, yeah. But that's a really great observation. So there, there is, um, there's some maybe we could say like some of the bones are the same, so to speak, right? So like uh, S versus Ace, um, E versus A, right? Amen and Ete, good. So maybe, maybe another question I could ask you is like, why do you think that's the ending? Why did you think Ete was the ending? Or on, S, E, Amen, Ete, on. Why did you think those were the ending? Why didn't you think that was a part of the stem? Okay, good. Okay, and so is Lou, is that the same stem we saw in the present? It is, yeah. So there are maybe two uh, changes, so to speak, right, that we saw. The first, Luke, as you highlighted, like we have something stuck on the beginning. The second was we had some endings that, you know, again, were the same endings. And we had some endings that were uh, similar, maybe with slight changes, and some that were just different altogether. So what we see is, on the one hand, the same basic structure of stem plus ending. Does that make sense? So we have stem plus ending, and then we have this little thing up front, which is called the augment. I'm going to talk about that. The augment. Um, algeo is actually um, a Latin verb, um, which means uh, we get it like augment. Auxiliary power would be one derivative. Augeo, augere, auxi, aux, aux. Some, I think it's an X there. Auxiliary power. If you have auxiliary troops in a battle, you know what that means? Extra, yeah, it actually means I increase or I lengthen. <laughs> so auxiliary power would be your backup power, so to speak. Oh, it's okay, the power went out. We've got auxiliary power, right? We've got a generator or whatever. So this is called the augment, or you can think of it this way, the, the lengthener or the extender or something like that. It, the, the increaser of the word. It's a prefix. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. But before we talk about that augment, um, so we've got our stem and our endings. We can see we're still able, right, so to speak, to find our, our root in our translation. We'd still be able to find our person and number by, by our endings. Eloan, Elois, Eloa, Eluamen, Eluata, Eloan. So there it was in our second person, plural. Okay. So we're going to talk about the augment, but first I want to talk about the, the actual idea of the imperfect. 
If I asked you, like, what does imperfect mean? What would you say it means? Imperfect. Incomplete. So perfect means complete. Oh, that's kind of a cool idea. See, if you asked me, when I was like middle school me, you said, what does perfect mean? I would say sinless. So imperfect must be sinful. This is the sinful verb. No, okay. No, it's, and, and actually perficio, which is also a Latin verb, a lot of these words come from Latin, even though we're talking about Greek here. Perficio means I finish. So perfectum, to be complete, to finish the thing. So imperfect means not completed. It's an open-ended action from, from the standpoint of the narrator. Okay? So when does it happen? Well, it happens in the past. So we're going to put the imperfect back here in the past. And the way that it happens, the aspect, the how of the verb, could be two types. It could be what's called the progressive. I was destroying, or in this case, y'all. Y'all were destroying. Or it could be what's called an iterative. Iterative. And that comes from a Latin word that just means again. So you can think of it as repeated or habitual past action. Y'all used to walk your dog every day. Now that in English sounds like but you don't anymore. That is not implied by the Greek. It is just declaring this habitual, uh, you know, uh, my dad would read the Bible every day in the morning. And again, that may sound to our ears like I'm implying that he doesn't do that anymore. That is not what's there in that verb. Does that, make, does that kind of make sense? And again, this is always the, this is the, the translator's challenge. How do I not imply something that to my, my English ears, so to speak, are going to, to sound to imply certain things? Okay. So the imperfect, well, what does that mean? And how does it work? Well, it works this way. And we're not going to get this yet. But how the imperfect, once we learn, as we kind of learn more tenses, what it does, I like to think of it like a, like a painter painting the background canvas of action. So often, for example, it would function this way. If we said, like, I was walking down the street when a car hit me. In that, Im <laughs> sorry, bleak example. Um, what it does is it sets up kind of the canvas on which the aorist action, which is another tense, that the aorist action, which is a simple, a simple past action. So almost always, um, though, not, though not always, but almost always, the imperfective action is going to be put in a narrative into relationship with other simple actions. Does that make sense? That usually are like interrupting it. Um, usually, you know, Jesus was walking and his disciples were picking grains of wheat and the Pharisees were enraged. That kind of a thing. So it's this, again, like this context setting up tense. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? Okay. So for a little while, I'll just tell you in chapter 10 and in chapter 11 when you get the imperfect middle passive, those sentences are going to kind of sound clunky to us because you're going to have a lot of these like, they were saying, you know, we were traveling. And we don't, we don't like for those to be isolated. We like to have that like set up and punch, set up and punch if you're telling a story, which that is normally how it works, but we don't know those tenses yet. So we're not going to, so we don't see those as much. They'll, they'll, they'll stick them in in the Septuagint. Okay. So what are your two options? Yeah, y'all were destroying, good, or you all used to destroy, um, and again, um, or maybe, maybe better, um, you all, oh, the, here you go, here, you could, you all, uh, you all would destroy, you, uh, but see, that sounds like potential, you would destroy it if you could, it's, that, again, this, it's just a problem, so, uh, so in context, you might have something like, um, Every Saturday, you would walk to the park. Does, does that make sense? So that every Saturday, right, communicates again and again and again and again. This was, this was a common thing. This was an iterative, repeated thing. 
Okay. Um, so and again, this is this is the challenge we have in English. Like, right. would sounds hypothetical. Right. Anyway. So in Latin memory, where the kids memorize, like, what is the function of the instrument? Mm-hmm. And they know, like, here are my options when I'm translating. Yes. Like, yeah. Like this helper and this. Were blanking. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it is. Okay. It is. I just, um, I think a lot of Latin programs, and I totally get it. It's hard. This is hard. And it's, it's hard. And it's tricky for kids um, t to really be taught that in English, for example, if I saw in English, uh, 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 we, um, you know, we would go to the park every day. That would go is the same, it's the same tense. It could be, right? Because these are two different, I'm going to take the aorist off for just, j just like with the present, I go, I am going, that's really hard for kids to see. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I'll say this, it's not, um, it's not imperative that a third grader or a fourth grader or a fifth grader be rock solid on that. Like in, in my opinion as a teacher, that is an area I am fine with them to kind of muddle through for a while. And I think our job as teachers is kind of to, like just <laughs> to keep reiterating that of like, oh, remember, you know, remember guys, like that, you know, I know it says like I am swimming. And so you want to make that I am swimming, but it's not that. Um, so like usually, he, so here's what it would look like in Greek, right? If the student, I keep, I'm just going to hold these in my left hand. Okay. Um, so, so here's what, what would happen. Oftentimes, now again, they'd be in Latin, but we'll just do it in Greek. Um, uh, a me, a me, a, yeah, okay. A me, luo, something like this. This is wrong. I just want to highlight, this is wrong. But when they see I am destroying, right, this is what they're going to do. They're going to say, oh, I need an I am and a I destroy kind of thing. And so, anyway, when I see young students do this, I'll just read it literally. I am, I destroy. I'm like, no, 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 it says I am destroying. And it's like, no, it doesn't. Again, not a big deal. It's really not a big deal. I'm not hardcore about it. I would just go like, actually, you just don't even, you don't even need that. You just, just Luo would do it. Like, but then where's the I am? And I'm just going to tell you, like, there's a great Japanese proverb, 10,000 times and then begins understanding. And this is one of those like 10,000 timers where it's just like, when it clicks, it's hilarious. They're like, oh, right, it could be either. And I'm like, yeah, it's only taken us five years to figure that out. It's great. It's totally great. Just, just, we got it. And they'll look at you like, man, you should have told me that in fifth grade. And like, man, I, I should have told you. No, no, no. Clearly didn't get it through. Anyway, so, um, so yeah, that's all that like a lot of those recitations are trying to do is they're just trying to simplify it. Yeah. And, and we always, we have to kind of pick, um, for example, like when we learn the definition of a verb. Like if, if, if my second year old, or pardon me, second grade, second year old, second grade son says, oh, a verb's an action. Um, I would like him to say an a, a verb expresses an action or a state of being. Um, but I'm going to be okay with that. Because you know, I know in third grade Latin, he's going to see the linking verb and he's going to get a, a refining of his definition. And I know you know, his definition of a subject. A subject is the one who acts. No, but that's okay in the second grade. Like, we'll get, you know, we're going to refine that. Um, and so that's where I always feel like, sorry for the slight tangent, but like, as teachers and as parents, I think we can get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we put our kids on the clock, if that makes sense. So like, if you don't get blank by the time you're finished with third grade or whatever, right? If you don't understand this by the time you're 10, or if you don't, you know, whatever that, and I'm not saying we have to say that in an angry way, but just we have to be aware when we put certain things on a clock. And we better have pretty serious justification why, for why we're saying they must get, get blank by this time. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe not. Yeah. 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 Because there are multiple options for like how you can change it. Right. I would say, oh, I can see how the answer is like this, but here's another option. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where I was going with like, so what, like, how much do you have when you see something and you're in the impact? 
like in perfect form. Okay. It can be either this way or this way. Yeah. I would say, you know, so I would say, again, default, I would, I, I would default to the top one. So again, simple present, when in doubt, yeah. present progressive, progressive, totally fine, not a big deal. Um, that, that progressive imperfect, I was walking. Mm -hmm. Iterative, only if you have some kind of contextual reason to translate it that way. So for again, every day, if you saw that as an adverb. Yeah, that's going to move me into that kind of iterative category. Every day we would walk by the sea. Um, I, I would need, especially as a translator, I would need some kind of strong, strongly suggestive adverb or context to tell me this, this, is, a, this is a repeated thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So... Um, Stem, still the same stem. And I, I want to highlight one part from our recitation, and then we're going to talk about the augment to close our time. In your recitation, we're not here yet, so, so don't let it bother you, but on that second page when we say, what are the principal parts of Luo? Principal parts, I know you both have Latin. So in Latin, do you remember how many principal parts a verb has? Four, good. And there are some exceptions. Some have like three, but four is kind of your default. What a principal part is, you could think of it like, um, like your basic building block. Like, what do I start with? Do I start with that first building block? Do I start with the second building block? The third or the fourth? In Greek, notice, we have six building blocks, six principal parts. We are still on the first principal part. So I just want to highlight that. You'll notice, um, or, or you could notice this, the second principal part only does one thing. Do you see what the second principal part does to change the stem? Good, it adds a sigma. Yeah, and that's actually the, the sign of the future. So when I see that sigma, and what you'll realize, um, again, as you kind of build up your verbal systems, the present and the imperfect tenses, they are built on this simple stem of just lu. Right? And so once you learn more tenses, you could actually argue backwards. For example, I don't see a sigma, therefore I know it's not a future. Does that kind of make sense? But we can't argue that way yet because we don't know about those other what are called tense signs. Okay? So that's not where we are yet. So I just want to highlight this is going to use the exact same stem as our perfect stem, or pardon me, as our present stem. Forgive me. So, Blepo, the stem is blep. Um, Erkomai, the, ver, uh, the stem is erk. Um, epsilon, rho, key. Um, we're not doing anything with the stem. Okay? But here's what we are doing. We're adding those endings. Nothing special there. Just the same thing. I memorize my endings and I can put them on. The trick here is the augment. The lengthening that happens in the verb. Um, and there are a couple of different options we need to understand with the augment. First of all, um, we have this nice, easy, simple option for the augment, which is just if I have a consonantal stem, my stem begins in a consonant, luo, blepo, uh, 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 I was going to say apothnesco, but that's not one. Um, uh, uh, we don't have crino. Do we have crino yet? Okay, so crino. Anything like that, um, it's just going to add an epsilon at the beginning. So number one, we have a stem beginning with a consonant. We're just going to add that epsilon to our stem. That's it. So when I see those forms, for example, in my homework, I'm gonna, that, that'll kind of start to jump out at you. You'll be like, oh, I thought it was crino, not ecrinen. Uh, oh, yeah, there's the augment. There it is. Okay. So that's the first place that I can go. Second, and this is tricky. Don't let this bother you. Don't let it become like a, a burden for you. We could have, what's the other option? If we have a stem beginning with a consonant, we could also have a stem beginning with a vowel. Okay, 
So if we have a stem beginning with a vowel, we're going to have what's called a contraction. You don't need to worry about this a ton. All that means is vowel math. Okay? So I'm going to call it vowel math. The fancy pants word is contraction. But what we're going to get is something like that epsilon plus whatever that vowel or diphthong was. So for example, um, so here, for example, we'll just say eluon, elu, whatever it is. Here, let's say the verb akuo, right? Akuo starts with a vowel. And now I'm going to add an epsilon to that alpha. What do you think might happen if I added an epsilon to an alpha? No wrong answers. Okay, so you want to say? All right. Well, here's what's going to happen. It's going to become A. The, the, the contraction, it's called the square of contraction. Anyway, what's going to happen is if I get an epsilon plus an alpha, it's going to yield an eta. If I get, um, oh, this is, could be tricky, our, our verb, a gero. So we had a gair, right, whatever our ending was. A gero plus an epsilon is going to give us an eta also. So we're going to see a lot of those just simply put, the vowel will lengthen. That's the big so what. So we're going to do a lengthened vowel. It is. That's what's happening. Um, and later, I, th I think it's in this book. Um, it's either in this book or I had a handout when I was in undergrad um, called a um, square of contraction. or It's just a little like <laughs> XY plot. Oh, um, the contraction chart. Uh, if you want to see it, it's on page 124. And these are kind of your, your options. What happens when we add an epsilon to an epsilon, an epsilon to a diphthong epsilon? Now, it's not always, it's not always going to follow exactly this contraction chart. Uh, this is for a special subgroup of verbs called contract verbs, which you don't have to worry about for a while. <laughs> but anyway, that's just kind of like, hey, when these vowels come together, what tends to result? And you'll have exceptions to things. But that's, that's kind of it. So you don't get like an applause. You do not. No, you do not. And, and, and again, the only way I, I'll see this, for example, let's just say a kuo. I see a ku, and I'm like, AQ? I thought it was a cool. Ah, we've got not my alpha there. I've got an, a, uh, an eta there. What happened? <gasps> Lengthened because of contraction. So that's the second option. The third option is if we have a compound verb. So for example, uh, we had the verb uh, erkamai. Right, I come. But then we also had the verb um, aperkamai, uh, let's see, or dierkamai, or whatever, whatever compound we want. I'll say dierkamai. Let's see if they give you another one. Oh, they give you apothnesco, that's fine. Uh, apocteno, katabino. So you have these um, um, prefixed uh, prepositions. So what's going to happen? Well, Here's the big so what. When we add this, we are going to lengthen not at the beginning of the verb. We're going to lengthen right before or between the prefix and the verb itself. Does that kind of make sense? So this is going to become dierkomai. That's tricky. I think that's the hardest one to spot. Or like... Um, Apothnesco. What was uh, apothnesco, again, whatever our ending will be, it becomes this, this omicron between the prefix and our root, it becomes apethnesk. So really having eyes, and this is, this is hard, but here's the good news. You're probably not going to notice the augment first. You know what you're going to notice first? Not the root. You actually notice the ending first. You'll see on, 
And you'll go, where is on? You go, on, S, A, I'm an S, A, on. Oh, this is an imperfect. Oh, there's an augment. That's how your mind will actually work, usually. Especially for this kind of thing. You just, maybe your mind is just really better than mine. Um, and that is totally possible. But I, I, found, I find for myself, it's the ending that has me go augment hunting. Usually not the other way around. Whereas sometimes up here, I'll, I'll see like a coup, you know, and there'll be some verbs that you're kind of like, oh, right, right. Like that's, I can see that's um, lengthened. It's been augmented. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sorry. It was there for Erkamai. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, once we get the D on the front or the Kata or Ana or whatever. Yeah. And is there a list somewhere? Because I feel like it would be nice to know how so what are they? Because you can learn the words independently. Sometimes you have an idea about what it means. I, I think I ch check them on this. Um, so like, for example, in, in Lesson 10, if you go to that vocab on page 53, I, to your point, I think it's good to make a card that says, for example, here you can see unabino, I go up. Uh, uh, katabino is in here. Yeah, there it is. Katabino, I go down. Uh, do they have another one? No. But they have two, and you might even put those on the same card. You know, erkamai, d erkamai, ace erkamai. I'm trying to think what else they've given you. Anyway. If you see those, yeah, I think sticking them on the same card. Um, uh, it's funny, they give the Anabasis. Have you ever heard of the Anabasis? It's one of the coolest, like, uh, it's by this guy named Xenophon, who is another, he's the lesser known student of Socrates. So you have Plato, and Xenophon is a, a general, goes on to be a, a military general. And he basically takes 10,000 Greek mercenaries over to um, fight the Persians. I'm trying to remember, fight the Persians. Something shady happens over there. I'm trying to remember how it's set up. But anyway, they basically become, uh, they like are on the run and they have to, on a basis, the going up is them, basically their escape from Persia. And so they take these 10,000 men and basically he marches them 2,000 miles. And the on a basis is his story of these guys um, just trying to get away from Persia. And so it's just like Jerusalem, you always go up to Jerusalem, you always go up to Athens. So it's their journey back going up back to Athens, even though I'm sure they lost some elevation along the way. But anyway, um, so they give you that one. But yeah, I would, oh, up erkomai, there's that one. So even though that, that verb um, was in the previous chapter, erkomai, I, you know, yeah, I might add that to that chart. Um, you'll also realize, I think as you, as you start to pile up verbs, you'll get used to certain, like d, kata, up, ace, um, and you'll kind of get used to some of those as like, oh, this is a into or away from or something like that. Okay? All right. So you can see a chart, if, if, uh, if you want to, on page 54 into uh, 55. You can see just examples of that. Um, I, I will highlight one kind of um, exception that you'll see is, uh, again, on page 55. The, the verb fellow and the verb mellow. <laughs> um, Mellow, fellow, I don't know, uh, whatever uh, dumb mnemonic device you want to use there, you know, mellow, yellow, I don't know. Mellow, fellow, um, those actually just take lengthened augments. Uh, mellow could, could be either a standard emelon, amelon. Um, fellow takes amelon. So you can just kind of see that. Again, I'll just say, um, I would not spend a ton of time memorizing the augments. I would just work on my eyes getting used to um, seeing the ending, and then just being aware of, like, going hunting then, like, oh, right, uh, you know, for example, Aethalon, or uh, if, if I see Aethalon, I'd be like, on, on. Okay, that's an imperfect ending. A, what's that about? Like, why is there an Ada there? Oh, that's just a weird augment. There's something weird going on there. You don't have to worry about, like, unless you really have a desire to write Koine Greek, um, and so if that's the case, go, go for it, do it. I'm not going to discourage you from doing it. But usually it's more about us recognizing forms that we come across, you know, when reading the scriptures, rather than like, I need to be able to write this from scratch. Um, 
And if you find yourself struggling in, in those parts of the English to Greek, like, what was that augment? That's not a big deal. Like, as long as the big so what is, do I know there's an augment? Yeah, I don't know exactly how those vowels are going to combine. It's not a big deal, in my, in, in my opinion. Um, and that's where we're always, like, keeping our eyes on the prize. Like, what's the main goal? The main goal is to be able to read it. Um, and to read it, sometimes it's just recognizing it. Like, oh, I see an eh. Ooh, that could be my imperfect third person singular ending. Do I have an augment? I sure do. Am I built off the first principal part? Yeah, I sure am. That's what that is. And so seeing that and translating it. Okay. The other thing, you've got memory work of just the imperfect indicative of a me. Um, amen, ace, ain, amen, ate, ace on. The only thing I'll highlight, though I know um, probably accenting is not your favorite thing, is every one of those forms def is a uh, circumflex, uh, except for the first person singular. So if you're still tracking and working on accenting, that's the only thing worth highlighting. Uh, and you do have a uncommon uh, second person singular form of aestha, aestha, which is kind of funny, uh, as well as amatha for the first person plural. Amatha sounds like a nice first person plural form. Um, if you looked at it in our, our recitation, you'd see meth is in the first person plural. Aestha, not so much. That, that one can be hard to spot if you see it. I can't remember if it's in these exercises or not, but anyway. You'll see the other imperfects. We were. And we'll just translate that as were. Um, but notice in English, we don't have a difference between were, uh, simple, uh, if you ever learned Spanish. Um, I'm trying to remember how the tenses in Spanish. But like sometimes, uh, again, that Spanish uh, moods, actually this is, a, this is a profound insight from other languages. So whenever you feel a certain way, that goes into the imperfect. And you can kind of think about your feelings and your emotions of like when you're in the midst of an emotion, it feels like you've been feeling that way forever. You know, you're like, golly, I feel so terrible. It's like, I, it's just been five minutes, you know, and it feels like it's been forever. Um, I think that's maybe an insight of those languages. Emotions always go into an imperfect uh, uh, or a, a, a progressive, uh, ongoing kind of thing, not a s simple thing. So, anyway. Though in English, we don't, we don't have an ability to distinguish between I was sad and I was sad. It was and was. Whereas other languages, they have the ability to distinguish between ongoing, imperfective kinds of things versus simple, completed things. We just don't have that in our language. We wouldn't say, I was being sad, right? You'd be like, mm, that's a little clunky. All right. Augment plus ending. You got it. I believe in you. That's it. See y'all. Enjoy three weeks till I see you next. Take your time. Do your exercises. Check the answer key. Find those odd notes. Um, can I ask you a quick question about the exercises? Sure. Um, so in number two. Of um, uh, uh, lesson nine? Sorry. Lesson no worries. Nine, uh huh. No worries. Um, the very end there, the, um, the answer he said, by God himself, mm -hmm. is another yeah. option by his thoughts. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, this is like options in That's right. context. Yes. Have other yeah. Like yeah. 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 Um, there, the trick is, um, yeah, we just don't know. And, and notice, we don't know. And th this is worth, again, this is worth, is worth it in our minds of like, the reason why we don't know is because it's in the genitive, right? So that yeah. genitive, right, could just be a his, but since it's, it's clearly um, in some way going around along with tu theu, right, is that his, his God or God himself, right? So right. is it identical, um, or is it a possessive, or is it an intensive? Right. So there we could, we could look, if you remember, you could go back to our chart and go, well, do we have an option here? with that identical well, or intensive. Yeah. You know, to be honest with you, it, you know, th that position, um, that, that is predicate position, um, it could go either way to be honest with you. So, yeah, we just don't know. We just don't know if it's God himself. Uh, is that what I put in the answer key? God himself? 
Um, it could just as easily be his yeah. God. We just don't know. Um, and those are, I mean, those are the kinds of translation things where it's like, usually it's just not a big deal. To be honest, with you, you know, but I think it, it can help because we can be, we can just be humble about it. You know, like, oh, like, we don't actually know if it's this or this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's almost, oh, I think more often than that, that is actually what translation gets you. It's yeah. just, you're just humbler about like, ah, I don't want to, uh, call it over exegeting the text. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to make that word hold more weight than it, it can. Ha- you know that it can hold. I don't want a verb tense to hold more weight than it can hold. And sometimes, like, we can we can try to make the grammar hold more weight than it can hold. To be honest, with you. or again, the particular vocabulary word. Oh, he picked this word, not this word, and that means he's thinking this. Maybe again, just depends. Just depends. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Uh, I was reading in Jerome. We were looking at Jerome and Paul's Greek side by side, and Jerome had used four synonyms. It was really interesting. He'd used four synonyms to translate the same root in Greek. So the Greek word was the phron, or the phronema root, which is like head, mind, um, focus. uh, and 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 it implies kind of like what you're focused on, that's what you do. So this is, this is the word that's used like the mindset on the flesh. Um, but Jerome in his translation he used four. So he used like prudentia. He used, golly. Anyway, he, he used four different words. I was kind of shocked because in Paul it's very explicitly clear that he is playing with the same root idea. And Jerome used four different words for it. And it was funny, the students were like, he keeps rotating this word, almost like he, he's like playing with the word family. Uh, and so if, if you're reading just Jerome, for example, you're going to go, oh man, Paul is, is, is playing with this language of wisdom or insight or perception or focus or something like that. Whereas when you see Paul, you just see him continually hammering the same word. Um, so that's what's really fun. I, I always find it really fun when I read different translators. And that you can kind of see like, especially like ancient translators, Oh, this they're they're trying to bring this idea across into their own language. So anyway, um, it was surprising when I saw it. I remember thinking like, oh, why did he do that? And I was like, maybe he doesn't he doesn't have a good verb root for some of them. He doesn't have a good verb root, I don't think, in Latin for what he wants to do. Whereas Greek, it's like it's like in English we have like lawful and right and righteous and legal, and those are all those would all be covered by the same root in Greek, the deke root. Um, so to be law-abiding, so to speak, is to be righteous. But those sound totally different in, in English, right? Like, um, so when you see like everyone who breaks the law is unrighteous, in the Greek that is like true by definition. Like all you, you, what you said is everyone who is adikaya is adikayas. Like, yeah, of course. <laughs> like, the, that's just reality, you know, so anyway. But that, that can sound weird to us when it comes into a different language.